All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. We have a packed schedule today. So thank you and hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for an exciting conversation with Urbed. My name is Mark Houck and I am the Grants and Impact Analyst for the Stonely Foundation, as well as our moderator for today. If you are unfamiliar with the Stonely Foundation, our organization typically funds fellowships for those working at the intersections of youth justice, child welfare, health, and education the goal of improving life for young people in our communities. We are also proud to support a cohort of youth partnership organizations that are all youth led or youth centric and committed to growing the leadership and advocacy of young people in Philadelphia. Our webinar today highlights the excellent and incredible work that our youth partners at Urbed in particular are doing. As we begin our discussion today, if you have questions for Urbed, you can submit them to us by using the Q&A button. You should see it along with the rest of your buttons in your Zoom panel. Um, please include your name and organization in your message to us so that we can better respond to your question when we get to the Q&A portion during the latter half of our event. Now I'm excited to introduce Brandon Archer and Aaron Gill Wilson, who are co-executive directors at Urbed and our guests for today. Brandon is a student at Swarthmore, conducts research on the implications of activism with SIA, and as a Mellon Mays undergraduate fellow, he has been recognized nationally for his founding of the Philadelphia Black Students Alliance and other racial justice organizing. Aaron is known for founding the nonprofit Mentally Eat, or Evolve, Achieve, and Transform, with the goal of addressing the needs of young people in her community by providing mental health, financial literacy, and self-advocacy support. Aaron is also recognized as a social activist and leader, both in and outside of the school community, and she has spoken widely on anti-racism, gun violence, and inequity in education. Aaron and Brandon, thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us. Excited to be here. Thank you for having us. I'm excited as well. Likewise. So for those in our audience who've never heard of Urbed before, can you start off by telling us about Urbed, Urbed the organization, its mission, and the work that it does? Of course. Um, so Urbed is a nonprofit based here in Philly. We started in 2016, um, and we are completely youth-led. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about today of like, what does that mean to be fled and, and what are the implications of that? But broadly, we believe that students should be at the forefront of the change happening in the school district. We focus on educational policy um, and our main mission is to just affect change the realities of young people's lives in Philadelphia. We are a group of students who have been living, you know, everything that's been going on in Philadelphia for the last 15 or so years. Um, and Urbed is an inflection point where through policy, advocacy programs, in-school programs, we're able to change some of the things we see. And I'm excited for Aaron to talk a little bit about our advocacy. Hi everyone. So one of my favorite things about Urbed is that we're for students by students. So we get to address issues that matter to us most, issues that we see going, issues that we face daily in our school community, we get to actually do something about it and advocate for not only ourselves, but our peers as well. So that's a big reason why like I joined Urban and I'm a part of the advocacy side. So some of the things that we do, we attend the school board meetings, just making sure we're well educated and well informed about the things that are going to be happening about the things that already happened, the new policies that's being created. We make sure we'll, we're extremely informed about it and able to properly educate and communicate these things to other people in a more comprehensive way. Um, we also um, have events, like our, our biggest thing is um, policy work and educating others. So like we'll have events to educate other people. We just recently had um, a open discussion. Uh, it was a mayoral candidate town hall. So just educating people about the mayoral candidates and like more information on how they can be involved in the voting process, stuff like that. So. We do that. We educate people through our events, community partners, and attend other meetings. Yeah. And we also just have some larger campaigns that we do. Uh, our most notable one right now is the Empowering Student Reps campaign. Uh, that is reimagining the way that young people are involved on the Board of Education. We have our Reimagining School Health and Safety, looking at different ways to Think about school safety and health. What does it mean for us to have police officers in schools? What does it mean for us to instead invest in mental health resources and look at students holistically? Uh, and then as a subset of our Empowering Student Reps campaign, what we've been in the news most recently for um, is our lawsuit that we're doing with the ACLU, um, basically arguing that the Board of Education violated the Sunshine Act. 
uh, in their two minute speaker limits. So as Aaron mentioned, we're doing the programs, we're getting into schools, we're um, hosting uh, events at our spaces, um, but we're also approaching you know, the, the issues of Philadelphia education from every different angle in the courtrooms, the classrooms, to actual protests and different organizings like that. Fantastic. So um, one of you mentioned that, you know, this is an organization that is for students by students. And I know you've mentioned kind of a lot of ways already in which students are involved in the work that you do. Um, but is there anything else that you can tell us or anything to add about kind of the roles that they serve in Urbed and how it really is unique and different from other traditional nonprofits? Of course. Um, I can speak on those things structurally. And then Aaron, if you want to touch on what it's actually like to, you know, be a student leading a nonprofit. Um, but Urbed was created truly by high school students, right? So our entire leadership, um, our executive directors, Aaron and I, our department directors, the people who are helping write grants, you know, this is an entirely student-run process. Um, and when I say student-run, I think the biggest difference and what makes this different from a traditional nonprofit profit is the way that we've infused empathy into the entire process. I think something that happens a lot in the nonprofit space, and especially working with certain demographics, is that the work can become very inhuman. It can become very exploitative. You know, we're trying to we're trying to change the the nature of things in Philadelphia. And sometimes it's really difficult when, you know, all of this work that we're doing and sometimes this intangible stuff we're doing has to be translated into data and and certain things for grant reports and and, and you know trying to push the, the the funding aspect of it all what urbed does is reposition empathy and reposition students at the center of everything right so in our grant reports we are sharing testimonials instead we're opting for verbal um, reportings any different way that students voices can be seen uh in terms of our actual board it's not very often that you see young people on the boards of nonprofits. Urbed has young people on their board, you know, anything that feels like we need to do it because we're a traditional nonprofit, we strike that through and really understand and dissect why are we doing this? What are the, what is the purpose of board dues? And is that actually something that's limiting young people from serving on boards and helping make decisions? So we got rid of board dues and we do a sliding scale now, you know, young people doing the work, what does it mean for us to pay young people to do the work? Uh, and now a significant portion of our budget is flexible spending that can be used for youth stipends. So in every single facet of the organization, we've considered how can this be the most equitable thing and how can we make students really be able to access this work? Um, I think specifically for me and my experience, um, I joined Herb Ed when I believe right, it was around COVID time and it was right after everything, all the Black Lives Matter uprising, all the protests were happening. And so it was a huge sense of passion and hurt and wanting to feel seen that not only myself, but my peers at school and everyone we all had with nowhere to release it. And so joining Herb Ed gave not only me, but what I saw, um, other members on a team, a space where we can be fully, like we can express our passions and express the things that we care about with space to actually find some solutions and create some, yeah, create some solutions to help solve them and to do something about them. So we were able to knowledge ourselves, to be knowledgeable on the people, the right people to go to. Sometimes like we have problems and we have things that we want to address, but we don't know who to address them with or where to address them or when. So Urbag gave me that space for that. It also, um, being a young person in advocacy, like Brenda said, it can be a lot, especially like running a nonprofit. Um, it can be really, really draining, especially when the advocacy work you're doing is, is something that other people may be passionate about or may care about, but not ac actively want to work on it because they know how draining it can be or how much work it can be. So it's something that, I'm not going to lie, you do need to motivate yourself and you do need to push yourself to do it, especially on those days where you don't feel seen. And the people that you do, you are told to go to, you go to them and they aren't listening to you. Those are the days where you got to motivate yourself most. And so it can be a lot. It can be draining. But I think just recognizing and reevaluating and realizing, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the right word, why you joined in the first place and why you want it, why you're here is most important because 
the change start with you. If you don't do it, no one else will. So I love it. We're for students by students. Absolutely. I'm sorry, Thank you. I might be rambling. <laughs> No, no, that was fantastic. You did fantastic. Um, and I do want to focus at some point on that experience and what it's like to be a young person more specifically, you know, in this work and doing this work day in and day out. Um, but just to kind of, again, to give folks a sense of the work that Herbed does, you know, I know that you all provide some training to young people and, and through your Herbed Fellowship Program. Can you tell me a little bit more about, you know, how that program operates, how it recruits young people and kind of the, the, the training and experience and opportunities they go through as they go through the, the, the fellowship? Of course, I'm going to speak on the fellowship and then also our new internship program as well, because they have similar messages. Um, but we really believe every single essence of what Aaron just said, of really learning about who do I go to? How do I make the change that I want to see? The fellowship is the answer to that question. Um, and I think that's really exciting. It is a paid year long fellowship, where for the first half of the year, our fellows learn about all of the organizing of Philadelphia. We are located in such an extremely critical place for organizing, for Black organizing, queer organizing, um, all these different forms and identities. Let's learn about those things. Let's take you to those places and let's have you meet those people that made those decisions that impact your everyday. So that's what we do for that first half. And then for the second half of the year, they have this beautiful opportunity to work on any project of their choosing that relates to Philadelphia education with the funding and support of the Urbed team. And at the end, they present it. And in the past, we've had resource data banks for mental health. We've had resources for people experiencing houselessness. We have had um, someone trying to combat environmental racism in Philadelphia and some of the you know, knowledge dissemination of that in the city. Uh, so those have been really exciting experiences, but at the core of the fellowship is we are fostering individual people to learn how to leverage all of the power around them and all of the power that they intrinsically have. You know, you don't get an opportunity like that in Philadelphia. You don't get an opportunity like that in general as a young person that has just let us pour resources into you, time into you, love into you so that you can change the things around you. So we do that through the fellowship and then we do that through our internship program as well now. Um, hoping that the people that are in these roles and in these positions can become Urbed team members, can become organizers in their communities, can start Urbed chapters. Um, you know, even if that journey stops with Urbed uh, after the fellowship, now you have a set of people, 12 every year, who have this entirely robust and complex repertoire of skills of organizing, right? Who is my city council people? How do, what, how do I synthesize, you know, this legal jargon? How do I rearticulate it so that my community can understand it? How can I take the knowledge I'm learning and make sure that it's impactful in my community? Those are all questions that the fellowship answers. And those are all things that now the fellows have to move forward. So that's our fellowship program a little bit. Aaron, if you want to add anything. I believe you've covered everything. Um, um, after speaking to some people who were fellows and got to be a part of the fellowship, they said a lot of the same things. They gave them a chance to really um, express their emotions in regards to everything that was happening, like in their school communities, whether, because we got also got that, that's another way we get to learn about a lot of the things going on in different school communities, because the entire school district is made up of multiple different schools. So being as though we only go to a select, the select schools that we go to, we aren't really knowledgeable as to what's going on in those smaller schools and other schools that we are in. So the fellowship, we get to also learn about more issues going on in schools and they, they enjoy it because they learn about self-advocacy and it has really positive results, so. Awesome. Thank you both. And I just want to highlight something you said, Brandon, which I think is so critical to the, the programs that you offer, which is that this is a paid opportunity, right? Young people often have such little time and so few resources to kind of do things outside of the, the structure of just maybe going to school. And so um, I don't know if you want to elaborate just a little bit about how that, that putting that money in the pockets of the young people who are doing this program actually, you know, enables them to do the program and to do more with it than they would otherwise. Of course, of course. Um... I think the, the thing that we really need to understand when we're talking about like, why do young people need to be paid for this work is because this is not a job we clock out of. This isn't something that ends at 4.30. This isn't something that starts at eight o'clock. We are organizing for our lives. We are organizing for gun violence to stop affecting our communities, to stop affecting us. 
We are organizing for our schools to be resourced. We are organizing for asbestos in schools that we went to to be addressed. You know, this is a lifestyle. At nighttime, we're sitting here strategizing about board meetings and in the mornings we're testifying and in the afternoons we're, we're organizing in the office. This is a full time thing. Right. And it, to every single experience, to every campaign we do, to every moment and everything, we are bringing personal experiences and work and effort. And it takes a lot. It is a lot. And it is this constant cycle of being underestimated. Right. You put a, you know, you just look at our bed holistically, we are black led. There is that first layer of being underestimated. Our bed's advocacy is led by a black woman who is amazing. Shout out to Erin. Y'all will never be able to see Erin's full genius in this hour, but if you have the chance to talk to her, you will be amazed. Um, but there are so many different ways in which our organizing is being questioned. And then to think that it's a room of 15 to 20 year olds that are doing it, um, you know, but we are doing such impactful, substantial, substantial work, you know, and, and to think that this little group of high school students, this group of college students are able to establish a, a free office space in Philly for any Philly organization, any young people organization, was able to be the only youth-led group that was a part of dissolving the SRC. You know, it's things like that and little strides. Uh, but we have to see young people as able. We have to see young people as having agency. You know, we are, it's on our website and it's everywhere, but I really live by it. People always say, oh, we're the leaders of tomorrow. We are leading a movement today, right now as we speak. And it is so important that people from every single different walk of life are able to be a part of that fight. Doing advocacy work, stopping to organize, to be in calls, to, 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 to make your way to 440, that is a luxury. That is a luxury that often is only reserved for Masterman, SLA, Central, and our magnet schools in Philly. We need to be able to confront that and break that down and put the funds, put our money where our mouth is as funders, as a community, you know, as supporters of youth work to say that I will allow, I will help young people to fight for change in their community and to ease the burden of people who are having to work two to three jobs, take care of their siblings, bus to school, come back and then go to a meeting. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. To support youth organizing, we can't just support the program. We have to support the youth doing the program. We want young people to lead the change and to be at the forefront of the fight. We have to support those young people as they fight. And sometimes that's also monetarily. Thank you, Brendan. Aaron, anything to add? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Sure. So, you know, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, how important it is, you know, so, so often we think of young people as, you know, they're, they're volunteering or they're working for very little pay or like they just have so few resources, I think I said, you know, so little time already that to ask them to go above and beyond, you know, kind of what their current day to day responsibilities already are is a huge ask. And so I, I just think it's incredibly important that Urbed funds, you know, the fellowship program in particular, and, and possibly even the internship program and, and why that those funds are so important. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to, to that conversation. Yes, um, I wanted to speak from my personal experience. Um, during the Herb Ed, I've always had a passion. The passion was always there, especially being as though a lot of the issues that we address are issues that I face or that not only myself, but my peers face, especially as Brenda said, as a black woman and advocacy work is a lot. Um, I think that a lot of people like it's it's not it's way deeper than just when I came in I didn't have I had the passion I had I knew I had all of the the motivation to advocate for myself my peers I had all of it but the only thing where I felt I liked that was like properly expressing it so over time with urban and still I'm still learning how to properly express how I feel and express the things like express everything like I'm still working on it but all of the passion is there and I say that to say is way deeper than just oh yeah we gotta attend a school board meeting we have to attend this meeting we have to do this we have to do that to make sure we can do this it's it's not about the money it's way deeper than that it's 
I just lost my cousin to gun violence. I got to go to Urbed. I got to go to 440, hear about the policy they're creating, hear about how they're putting metal detectors in schools and hear about how they're putting more policing in schools and hear about, it's, it's, it's way deeper than that. So when we're creating, when, me, when I'm in meetings for Urbed and we're creating gun violence prevention workshops and educating people on like trauma, trauma, um, what, Brandon, what's trauma? Please help me. The three series trauma community. No, that's it's a it's a it's a word that's being used by it's all over. Sure. But the um when we're we were we're creating a three a three part workshop series in regards to gun violence, and so I said I brought it up to say like it's way deeper than just like us creating events based on trending topics or issues that's going on in the city. It's issues that are affecting us in our personal lives, and so not only are we grieving, but we're grinding too, and it's it's hard, and but we're making it happen. So it's way deeper than just a paycheck or, oh yeah, we got to attend this. It's affecting us in our personal lives heavily. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. And I, I want to get to a deeper conversation about that in just a moment, but I have one more structural question for you all, which is that you talked a little bit about the, the campaigns, um, you know, that you all lead and the work that you do. I don't know if you have anything else you want to add about those three, or um, if you want to talk a little bit about how you decide which campaigns you're going to pursue, you know, you're kind of a small outfit. So I can say something briefly and then Aaron, I'm handing it all back to you. Uh, but how we decide which campaigns, how we decide all of our movements is from actually looking at the community. It's just that simple. We look at what students want. We have those students on our team. Uh, we have those students in schools and, and we just take in everything. You know, that is what determines what we do for everything, campaigns or not. Our direction is determined by the school community. Um, in Philadelphia's young people community. I think I touched on this briefly before uh, when I mentioned about um, how not only are we're getting information and we're getting the pressing issues going on in our schools that we're attending, but we also get to learn about the issues going on in other schools through our fellowship program, through um, our community partners, through um, social media even, through um, like the school board meetings and meeting with other organizations there and other student groups there. So um, yeah, it's just community research, have you and like being active. And that's another thing, like you really have to be active and step foot in the community. You'll never know what's going on in the community unless you're in it. So you need to actually like put your foot out there, get there, like let people see you see in the same way you want to you want your voice to be seen and heard you got to see and hear other voices because you're not only advocating for yourself you're advocating for other people as well so you learn about the issues going on and you address these issues going on by doing your community research and making sure you're checking in with people i think that's most important Well said. And I, again, one thing I just want to highlight and then we'll transition to our second conversation is just that I'm always impressed by the amount of activity, the thoughtfulness you put into all of this, the organization. But again, you know, and it kind of would seem from the outside looking in that you're a much larger operation. But um, as we've discussed already, you know, a small outfit, I think just a handful of staff, um, you know, a smaller office space. I, so kudos to you all for the work that you've all done with so few people. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but otherwise I'll transition us to our next um, talking points here. Oh, yeah, I appreciate it, but we're scrappy. We're we're grassroots, you know, and I just think we're going to keep on articulating that. And we're always looking for partners and community funders and people who see our vision um, and, and see our dedication and our passion and want to push that forward. Uh, so hopefully we can talk with some of the folks on this call. All right. Thank you, Brandon. So I know you both have spoken a ton already about the experience of being a young person in Philadelphia, kind of what that's like, what it's like to be a part of our bed um, and the work that you all do. Is there anything else, um, you know, so, so tell me a little bit more um, as well about what the experience is just like of doing this work. You know, you say a little bit, you know, it's difficult to kind of do it day in and day out. Um, not only if there's anything else you'd like to say on what that experience is like, but also how um, are young people managing that before they come to Urbed? How are they managing that once they're in Urbed? You know, what lessons are they learning from the work that you all are doing? Um, I think first, it's important to have 
especially doing advocacy work and this isn't a job where we can just clock in and out it's constantly on our heads and on our mind day in and day out like we already addressed so I think just having that space where we understand and we understand we're humans one so we have emotions we go through things and we need space to process those things so I think as a team understanding it about each other and allowing for those team members to have their space when needed because um you can't I think if you want to really like put your best foot forward as something you need to be able to fully I use the term the phrase lock in you need to be able to fully lock in on it and you can't if there's other things going on so just giving the team members that space they need if needed I think also um just understanding it the topics and the issues that we're addressing aren't light topics and they shouldn't be considered as just, uh, oh yeah, let me just throw this together. Let me just throw this one pager about this together. Like understanding that these are topics affecting, if not your life, people's lives, people have lost their lives based on these topics. So I think just understanding that these topics aren't light at all and they shouldn't be treated as such. And so you may need time to process and you may need time to really like fully feel and so giving us giving us that time as well and that space too is important. Especially as young people. We're young. <laughs> <laughs> That's so real. Um I think for Urbed staff, you know, nobody comes into it. Uh, and this is my experience as well. No one comes into it with everything figured out already. Right. Uh, no one knows what it's gonna be like to balance school and literally changing the city as a whole no one's going to know what any of those relationships and dichotomies look like um i think it was the job of our bed and and it's kind of been a necessity for us to have to be incredibly flexible and to go slow i think about this uh, uh this little tip that i got uh, by way of hannah gone and she says you know you need to go like incense so you can burn slowly and more potent and then you can stop and restart versus going like a match and just burning really fast and burning out and I think oftentimes there's this pressure to produce and there's this pressure to make sure that we're, are you meeting this quota and are you doing this deadline and are you getting this done? And I think that's very real. And I, and I, I, I also understand that we need to stop sometimes. I think Aaron really stressed it that this is so personal and this is so vulnerable. This is incredibly vulnerable work. Um, so as an organization, how structurally can we be the most fluid? You know, if that makes sense, how how can we put in systems that allow us to step back when we need, you know, what does time off look like? What does it look like to, what does check-ins look like? Always being receptive to feedback. What does feedback look like? What does accountability look like? You know, all of these considerations have informed how we have shaped the organization. We are okay with just stopping. We are okay with scrapping something if it doesn't feel authentic to the team. If it doesn't feel like something that we enter from a place, you know, where we can use an I statement, a place of lived experience. Um, and I think that's the most critical part of, of our bed. And that's also just the easiest way to, to kind of sum up what needs to happen. I think from my personal experience entering our bed, I started in 2020, I think, um, maybe as the communications director. Uh, and I was in high school. I was what, like 17 leading a department um, for a hundred a month. And, and it was, it was rough. It was really rough. Um, you know, and, and, and I think as time has gone on and my responsibilities have gone and it's been a very difficult process. Um, I think it's also hard when sometimes there's not like institutional or kind of culture changes in the nonprofit space that allow more flexibility and allow more compassion sometimes. Uh, but it's been really rough, but I, I really want to celebrate, you know, not only the Urbed team, but also certain individuals and certain foundations like Mark, right? I know we haven't had a moment to shout Mark out, but truly that's what a support system looks like. And if she's on the call, Michaela Warwick, who's on our board and, and, and Collective Climb founder, you know, there's different people within the Urbed family um, that support these young people that have supported me, you know? And I think that's also a critical component because this is a community. This is community work you know, uh, on the back of our Urbed t-shirts, we have the, in a, in a community that is divide and conquer, we need to become defined and empower, you know, it, we are a, a community, we need to empower, empower that idea, um, but also be together, 
none of this is going to be done alone. And I think our bet has really taken that idea to heart and that's informed how we've moved forward. Awesome. Thank you, Brennan. Appreciate the shout out. You know, I, we've learned a lot from Urbed since we've started our relationship together, you know, especially this newfound appreciation for that this work really requires flexibility, right? That if you just try to, you know, tightly bundle it all up and put it next to a checkbox and say, did you do it? Yes or no. And if you did, we'll check off the box. That's not how any of this works, right? Like we've often had these conversations about like, this isn't, these projects aren't going to change the world in two weeks or two months or two years. You know, this is, this is, you know, transforming systems is five years, 10 years, if we're lucky, 15 years, you know, that's the kind of time scale we're working on. And so thinking really holistically about like, right, how do you build a sustainable organization, especially with young people, you know, how do you build the flexibility into that to account for, you know, the, the challenges in doing the systems advocacy work and the challenges of being a young person, how it's different from, you know, I can only speak for myself, but like I am a nine to five, right? It's very easy for me to like start my day, you know, compartmentalize, right? To, to take care of the things I need to take care of, but within defined timeframes. And um, so many of you just do not have that privilege, so to speak. Um, so I think we've really benefited from getting a more holistic perspective on like what this work looks like and what young people are are dealing with and still accomplishing while trying to overcome those barriers. Really appreciate that. Um, There's something else I wanted to shout out here. Oh, I also love that your, your metaphor about the incense. And I think that's truly it, right? It's the slow burn as opposed to just trying to push as hard as you possibly can for as long as you can and, and burning out. Um, I have a couple more questions here and then we're gonna turn it over to audience Q&A. So one more time, I just wanted to let audience know, uh, we're gonna set aside about 15 minutes for questions here near the end of this webinar today. Um, please submit your questions. We would love to discuss them. There's a Q&A button down there. Just let us know who you are so we know who we're responding to when we get your questions. And I see we have a couple already, so I'll take a look there in a minute. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to talk about before we move on is, you know, in addition to capital T, capital W, the work, the substantive work, there are other activities that Urbed does to, you know, promote that emotional well-being. You know, the kind of the fun stuff, or the things like that you all organize with your your team. You can say no if you don't. <laughs> I know. I just there in her eye. Um, you got it, and then I'll go. I just wanted to make sure that I understood the question. Could you rephrase it, please? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, when we we come into the office, you know, we, we kind of talk about doing like this substantive work that can be really challenging, really emotionally taxing. Are there things that you or your team members organize, maybe events, activities with the team, activities with other young people? Are there things that you do to kind of try to like, you know, keep things light, right? Are there fun activities that kind of really help lift everyone's spirits and, and remind yourself so like we can have fun while we're also doing this work? I think the nature of things, yes, there are things. Yes, yes. Um, but I also feel like the moment that we're in right now, we've kind of paused on that for a second. Um, we are planning our movie nights for our office. I have all the canvases for our paint nights and you know we'll do fun things like that. Uh, but I think we're in a moment right now where I, like just incredibly candidly, we're feeling the weight of everything. Um, and I think what joy has looked like for us right now is rest. What joy has looked like for us is just being present for each other and stepping back. Um, so I think that's where we're at right now, uh, just incredibly candid. Um, but yeah, we have super fun stuff. And it's also, I just think you have a room of high schoolers who are friends now, you know, every team meeting is pretty fun. You know, I appreciate that candor and Aaron, I wanna give you an opportunity if you wanna say anything else, but right that there is both the substantive work and then also building in these opportunities for like lighthearted fun. But that is also, you know, to your point that also requires energy and it is categorically different from rest. I think it's important for everyone to see that you need all three, right? You need to do the work, obviously, that's the reason why you're there in the first place. You need some, some fun to kind of, you know, Keep yourselves grounded and we do this at Stoneman as well so I'm not just pointing the finger at you all but then you also do need those moments of rest and again we've talked you know pretty candidly and I appreciate your candor about building the flexibility in the work that we do you know to make time for that it, just because of how heavy these topics are and how personal they can become you know for all of us and especially young people living in the city of Philadelphia 
Aaron, I don't know if you want to add anything. If not, I'll move us on to our next question here. Okay, awesome. Um, let me see here. I think we have spoken a lot about the, the personal experience of young people in doing this work. I know you've touched a little bit on the, the power dynamics that can be in place, especially with a youth-led organization, especially with a Black-led organization, as you said. Um, if you'd like to say anything else on that power dynamic and how your organization or your young advocates navigate that process, um, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, I would say to you, um, you know, what are things that the, you know, the, the fully adult-led organizations, the other nonprofits, city leadership, what should they know, if anything, before coming to the table to negotiate with students? This is a good one. And also, I see we got in a question that asked something similar, so I'll speak to that as well um, a little bit later. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is that young people are fully capable. Young people have this agency, and we need to let them act on it. We need to let them act on it. These are lived experiences. That's what makes them qualified. What makes them qualified is that every single day they are going through it and navigating the system. They have every right to speak on the system and how it should change for them. And I think that's a really beautiful thing to really think about. You have people who are going through it and want it to be better. Um, and then also, I think just understanding, right? If you want to you know, invest in youth organizing and in, in youth collectives, really getting to know and understand what that community is, who that community is and what that needs, the needs of that community are. You know, people can write us a check. That could always happen. And, and you know, and it could be that one financial transactional relationship. But what does it mean when we look at that differently and are okay to look at that differently and say, what if we need a little bit more support in the administrative side? What if we need a little bit more support in the goal setting and the like making sure the organization is sustainable and lasts, you know, really being invested holistically and understanding that, you know, it could be a really beautiful relationship and it can be a really beautiful exchange when you come into it thinking that students are capable and equal in that conversation, that young people are equal in that conversation. I think that's really where it, what it comes down to. And also being okay with when things don't go the right way, right? I think that's something that is is really, really different for the nonprofit space is what happens when we don't meet that goal. And I I I, I want to make the distinction that, you know, a youth-led organization isn't no boundaries, no rules, everything in late, you know? But it's how can we do this process infused with empathy? How can we do this process with a holistic understanding of the community I'm working with? And those two things are very different. Um, and then also... Just understanding that, especially with Urbed, you know, and I'm going to say this briefly because I want to answer this question later on as well. Um, a lot of it's intangible. A lot of the, the effect and the impact is not going to be met by a data point. You know, so so we evaluate and what do we mean when we look at data uh, and, and what is impact to us uh, and realizing that with youth-led nonprofits and with Urbed, you know, sometimes those things are different. Absolutely. Erin, anything you want to say to that point? I think Brandon touched on a lot of the points that I wanted to mention, but I just wanted to piggyback off one of the first points he made, um, being as though we are students um, and we're the ones being directly impacted by all of the issues we're addressing um, when sitting at the table with adults or people who aren't students. I would just like for y'all to actually see us and hear us see us as students and see us as leaders, but don't underestimate our potential or the things that we can do in regards to advocating for ourselves. And also with underestimating us, um, it's just not only fueling us, but it's also taking away from the support that you could be giving us. You could be adding more to us. So like Brenda said, um, just supporting us and reevaluating what support looks like, support can be defined and viewed differently from different people. So um, for us, like Brenda said, not only just like a financial transaction, but more so like checking in on us as well. Like what's what's going on? What's new? What's a lot of people, like just knowing what's going on with us, what we have going, what we're doing and what we would like to do and how you could support, whether that's just lit being in the air or whether that's giving us a, a resource or anything like just really listen to us and see us. Yeah, and just one other thing. 
is I think we also have to be okay with just taking a chance on youth-led organizations. And it's just as simple as that. I think oftentimes there's an apprehension. There's a, a, this notion of it's not a secure bet. Um, we have to be bold and say, I will be the organization. I will be the person that is changing that paradigm. I am investing in youth people, youth people. Wow. I'm investing in young people. Um, and, and, and I'm willing to do that in all of it and that it entails, you know, from just like a administrative standpoint too, you know, securing that funding for our stipends is the most difficult task every single year. And I just imagine what would that landscape be and how different would our process and the organizing of young people in Philly be if we just said, I am going to make that jump and invest in young people. And I'm not going to be scared. I'm going to make sure that I am safe in doing it, but just also being spontaneous in that way. I think that's incredibly important as well. Absolutely. And I would add that I think, you know, as funders, we always talk about what are we doing beyond the grant, right? We can just write that check and be done with it. But is there more that we can possibly be doing, even with the limited funding that we have? And I would say for, you know, for us, you know, but making that grant or that was the start of our conversation, our relationship together, not the end of it, right? It wasn't, let's do all this investigation. And then we finally decided we're going to invest in Urbed and then we write the check and then we're done. We've, we've kind of had our relationship with the organization and we're kind of done with that. No, it's the start of the conversation. That's where you and I can come together. We've really, I think we've developed a candor and it's required us to be kind of vulnerable on both parts to say, you know, how do we, let's talk about this, right? What are some ideas and things that we could do together? And let's try a few things. And if they don't work, that's okay. But let's, let's see where this could go. And I think it's been really fruitful. It, you know, it resulted in this webinar that you all are seeing today. Um, and I could kind of go on at length about that. But um, I will just echo that I, I think uh, Brandon's absolutely right. You know, so Stonely, we fund those fellowships and kind of the more um, we research them and, and think about them really critically, um, the less, the more difficult it is to identify concrete checkbox outcomes, right? That the, the actual results of a grant are often more intangible than that. And certainly with, with you know, systems change, especially with advocacy, with organizing, um, this network building can often be difficult to see on paper, but it's very much real when you have these conversations. You know, again, you know, you said so much about all the work that you all have done, uh, Brandon and Aaron, and um, I think that all is all very real, even if we can't see it and touch it. So um, I'm going to go on too long about that. I do want to get to some of these questions, um, and then we'll, we'll have a little piece at the end if there's anything left to say on that. This first question here comes from Sarah Morningstar at ASAP. Um, as an organization that is committed to being youth-led, how do you navigate sustainability and transferring leadership to the next cohort, particularly as students graduate from Philly schools um, and I believe colleges as well? What do you do to prepare those people for the transition and the organization for the transition? Yeah, so there was a time where nothing. When I came in and I, I took the helm, it was a rough four months. Um, and I think just we learned from those moments, right? Uh, I think the biggest thing that we do is a lot of this pre-training. Uh, if someone I'm thinking for like, for instance, our new chief of staff position, uh, the person was on their way out. We had someone there about three or four months before they had very robust training um, that got into everything. We have our pipeline. So from the fellowship to the organization to think we're always running on a cycle. Um, and I think that we like structurally, we've just made sure that every single year we're if need be, okay to start at a fresh slate completely. Um, it just requires a lot of pre-planning. Um, we do a lot of trainings throughout. We do feedback at the end of every month. And then from that feedback, that generates the workshops, the trainings, um, the, the responses that are given back to the team. Uh, but we're just always trying to like make sure everyone feels fully prepared in every moment. We also throughout the year just move things around a lot or incredibly flexible structurally. Brandon, anything you want to say on that before we move to the next question? No, I believe Brandon touched on everything. Awesome. So for next question here, it comes from one of our funders. Funders often, I think this gets back to the, the checkbox conversation we were having. Funders often demand proof of outcomes before providing support. What is one thing or another thing you most wish funders and others who are considering supporting your work understood about how youth-led and advocacy organizations measure their success? Of course. Um, I think the one thing is like we have data. 
I think just like a reality as we haven't been able to avoid it. And it's also kind of helpful to have in moments. Um, but I wish the one thing that was known was be flexible in what you're asking for and in the mediums that you provide it. Something that's so important to me in grant reports is including testimony, um, is including photos and, and, it, and really being able to visualize those experiences and having people firsthand say, this is what this meant to me. Um, and sometimes I think that's a lot more productive than 12% of students in this zip code said this about this. And, and, and you know, if you're really trying to understand the impact of the program, I think about our fellowship, we were trying to do reporting on the fellowship last uh, cohort, and it was really difficult because there were a lot of moments where we would stop the curriculum and do something else. On paper, you don't really see what that gap is in having a conversation with the funders and having more narrative reports. Um, you were able to see that we had to stop because college application season was starting. Some of our fellows didn't think college was an option for them. None of them were prepared. Um, what does it mean now for the person who's running the fellowship to stop, pivot, and help them with their college essays? You know, it's little stuff like that, little nuances that there's a lot of intangible benefits and a lot of intangible work um, and support that's being done that I think you can really see and learn if you're open to having a dialogue with the funder and that being the kind of reporting. If you're open to testimony, if you're open to photos, if you come to an event and shadow it, you know, show up in that community, show up for that organization. And I think a lot of it is, I understand why there may be some apprehension because it's more work on the funder, right? But I think a part of investing in communities we don't normally invest in means we have to do some of the work before, you know, and maybe down the line, there's a system in place that you automatically see all that we're doing intangibly. Um, but for now, I say, open up the space in the reporting, open up the space in the grant applications for um, alternative methods of impact. Absolutely, and I'll second that and then Aaron, I'll, I'll give you a chance if you'd like to say anything, you know. So I'm speaking from a pace, place of privilege here as the grants and impact analyst of the Stonely Foundation, you know, that we're a low volume grant making organization. So we only have a few grantees at any given point in time, but that allows us to think about those qualitative questions and look at the answers. And that has always provided, in my opinion, you know, a richer understanding of the, the narrative, the work that you all are doing, the impact that it has, that again, you just cannot capture with quantitative metrics, right? You can say we've served, you know, X number of young people by giving them X number of trainings across two years. That doesn't tell you what the, right? Those are outputs. Those are just, you know, that doesn't tell you. You really need those free response, those narrative questions, that narrative there to build the context around, well, what does that mean? Why was this program created? What is it doing? What are people getting out of it? What is not only the short-term impact, but the long-term impact? And so we've trend, you know, we've kind of trended toward more towards those qualitative free response questions and letting the grantees, you know, guide the answers themselves and fill in those blanks for us. And again, that is not the start and end of the conversation. That is merely just the beginning, you know, reading those reports and then continuing to have the conversations. You know, I've learned so much more about the, the work that you've all have accomplished and the impact that you've had from our conversations. Whereas a report is just, you know, it's a piece of paper and it'll tell me a little bit, but it won't tell me the whole thing. So just absolutely, you know, seconding all that you've said, Brandon. Anything you want to add to that, Aaron, before we move on? No, I'm sorry. I I don't do a lot of the grant work. That's sorry. great. I'm sorry. I can take the next <laughs> all right. one. That's all right. I don't know if maybe you want to say anything about like, you know, so the work that you all do, right, it is intangible. It can be sometimes hard to see and even describe what the impact is and that it doesn't neatly fit into a little box where, you know, if you're, if the person in charge says, did you do this? It's not an, always an easy yes or no. It's a, well, kind of, but then we also had to take this into account. And we had to do, you know, X, Y, or Z things after the fact. Does that sound correct to you or? Um, I believe there has been a time where we have had to like step outside of the box, but it wasn't any, I don't believe it was anything too detrimental to sure. Let me think. I'm sorry. sorry for putting you on the spot there. <laughs> uh, just another thing too, as I think just leaving the lines of communication open between the funders and the, the fundee, if you will. Um, I think for moments that we do need to diverge, for moments that, you know, plans change, for moments that we have different ideas or need support in different areas, you know, none of those things are possible if there is not a 
really define relationship and, and, and what can you come to us with between the program officer and whoever's managing the grant at the nonprofit. You know, I think in so many moments we've had experiences uh, where retrospectively it was like, oh, I could have helped you with that. Or, oh, our, our, our organization could have I've done that. We have another fun, um, another uh, another organization that we fund in our portfolio and, and they work on this. You know, there could be this really beautiful, this beautiful um, relationship. But I think you just have to put in that work in the beginning um, and be open to putting in that work and initiating it too, um, to say that I am available for you. I think we've had some very distinct program officers in our time um, who have just made themselves really like, Ad, like adamant supporters of our mission um, and have made themselves available for, you know, the moments where we've needed to ebb and flow or just for really understanding the work that we do. It feels really nice to have a champion in our corner. And I think it's important for people to put in the work to be that. Absolutely. And I'll shout you all out as well. I mean, you've, you've been, um, I think it's very difficult to be that candid with the funder, especially because there's always kind of that, that, threat hanging over your head of, well, the funder could just pull funding or they could decide not to renew and, um, you know, choosing to kind of be vulnerable and talk about not only the, like, the, the accomplishments and the opportunities, but also the challenges as well. Um, because, you know, I, I, again, I can only speak for Stone Lane, you know, we're often interested in hearing both sides of that, both, you know, just because it gives us that full narrative, but it also lets us see, okay, where can we plug in, provide additional support? Um, and where would that be helpful? It's again, it's part of that, like going beyond just making the check um, and having those conversations. So I know we're running up, you know, close to time here. I'm going to ask one more question. We've kind of covered it already, but I'll see if there's anything else you have to add. Um, you know, are there any other misconceptions in addition to the ones that we've talked about um, for youth-led organizing that you wish you could debunk for funders or policymakers? Are there kind of myths um, that you think that they hold and they come into conversations and negotiations with you all that you wish they would not? I think the first is that we don't have it all together. Um, when a urban young person walks into a space, one of the young people that I've met in Philly walk into a space, they are doing it with a full arsenal and repertoire of knowledge, information, research, information on the policies, have synthesized it, able to like, you know, share it out, understand that. I think that's the biggest thing it is thinking that young people need, you know, so much more coaching to get to a place where they're able to contribute to the conversation. And I think that is just so untrue. Um, I had another one that's escaping my mind. So Aaron, if you wanna, you know, happen in the so we'll go back. I think a common misconception about youth and advocacy is that we aren't knowledgeable. This is one of the um, conversations I had with my professor, my interpretation analysis professor. Um, he was saying that we talked about um, the difference between like why, why we talked about how the, all of the, um, the Pan-African activists like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, how they were all young during the time and how that was important, especially for us and young people seeing them and hearing about their stories because as young people, I think our advocacy is most important because we're young, it's our future directly being impacted and being as though we don't have as much experience as older people would have within the same with the same system that they're advocating for because that's something that an adult told me that I spoke with about the advocacy work that I do for Herb Ed and she told me that she's been fighting for the same thing since she was younger and so I think that um just knowing that we're younger we're coming in with fresh and new ideas and is more gentrified kind of like we're uh, our ideas are also being aligned with the the new ways of the world and society now. So um, I think that was the misconception. Like the sum of my question is that we are knowledgeable and we don't know really what we're doing, so. And I think just another thing, Mark, I'm just gonna squeeze in, is involving young people in any process, whether that be a policy process, a funding process, really anything is not just symbolic. It is not just checking a box. It is not just, oh, well, we have two people on our board now, um, mission accomplished. You know, it needs to be this perpetual effort and this constant pursuit and one where you stop and reflect and revise um, 
it is not just enough to have one conversation. It is not just enough to, you know, but we have one represent really put in that energy and think about what are we doing that is upholding a system? What are we doing that is not conducive of inviting these voices and experiences and the beautiful, beautiful stories that they bring into the work that we do? You know, and it has to be something more sub substantive. It has to be something impactful and productive. Um, you know, really make sure that the efforts that we're doing are ones that are, are conducive of actually making change. And I think that's just one thing that we don't often think about, and especially in a policy space, and especially in a funding space, and even more so in an education space, um, is that we have all these like symbolic efforts um, and all these surface level efforts of incorporating young people and really community in general. Um, and we need to go deeper. We have to go deeper. And, and it really is detrimental if we don't. Absolutely. Thank you both so much. I have tons of notes here. I could just keep talking to you two for hours, but um, I can't hold our audience hostage. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, again, just a tremendous, you know, thank you for all of the knowledge and wisdom you provided us today. Um, so let me see, where's my end in here? I got so caught up in, in what you were saying that I forgot what I was supposed to be doing. Um, but, you know, before I let you go, I just want to make sure that you have a chance to kind of plug anything. Do you have any kind of upcoming events or other news you want to share with our audience before we go? Um, or of course, I'm sure people will kind of want to get in touch with you after the fact. So how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more or support your work? I think I could speak on the upcoming events that we have. And then Brandon, if you want to share ways that people could get in touch with us. Um, so we, as I mentioned before, we recently had a town hall discussing the mayoral candidates, candidates and just educating young people in Philly about who they are and um, some ways in which voting is important. So um, from that town hall, it sparked my idea for us to have a series of discussions in which we call hot topics. And so uh, our next discussion or next event coming up is the hot topic. And it's an open discussion about people in power. It's the one, one of three of those discussions. So this first people in power session is gonna be educating youth about the city government and ways they can reach out to the people who are part of the government, um, who specifically does what, just explaining the structure and what role they play in how the government is formed. So um, that event will be October 27th. It will be this Friday. The door is open at four o'clock and it starts at 4.30. It's gonna be in our space on 15, it on Locust Street, 1521 Locust. So you can find more information about that on our website and on our Instagram as well. Beautiful. Um, and then we also have other ways that you can support Abed First. You can always send me an email if you'd like to have another conversation um, or with myself, one of our board members, anyone on our team. It's just brandon at urbedadvocates.org. Um, and of course, Aaron at urbedadvocates.org. Uh, we are in such a critical time. We're in such an exciting time, but a very critical time funding wise. Uh, we have a youth office space. We have the Bullhorn student newspaper. We didn't touch on that a lot, but it is Philly's only student led newspaper. And Urban has taken it on to make sure that it can last and continue sharing youth voices and stories. Um, and then also trying to secure funding for our youth stipends. So there's all these different ways and all these different initiatives that we're trying to do. Um, so I would love to have a conversation to talk about which are the ways that you can support that, supporting our fellowship, supporting our youth organizers. And then there's also just more time commitment ways that you can support our bed. If you reach out, um, there's uh, moments between events, between board meetings, things like that, where we're really asking for community members to join us in our process. Um, so please, please, please reach out. We're so excited to talk. We could either do email, meet, or whatever is convenient. Um, but yeah excited to hear from you all and thank you Aaron for plugging the events we hope to see you all at the office again that's on our website awesome thank you both um I'll also add that this is only the first in our youth partnership spotlight series we have a handful of really amazing uh, youth partners and we're hoping to highlight them all over the course of the next year um, if you're subscribed to the Stonely newsletter look for more news uh, about our next spotlight in the coming weeks if you aren't subscribed you can do that by signing up at the bottom of the homepage on our website also give a quick shout out to two more virtual events that Stonely is hosting um, in November. November 8th, our Stonely fellow Shay Bilchik will be leading a discussion on his groundbreaking multi-systems integration pilot work taking place with uh, Delaware and Erie County in Pennsylvania. This work is making it easier for multiple systems to coordinate more effective care for young people. 
A week later, on November 14th, our Stony Fellow Arturo Zinni will join guests from Drexel University and Rush University Medical Center to discuss Healing Hurt People, which if you haven't heard of already, is an innovative hospital-based violence prevention program here in Philadelphia. If you can't find the registration pages for those events, email me and I'll be sure to send you a copy. And with that, I think we're all set. Thank you all for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thank you, everyone.